Okay, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the panel moderator for the first panel, uh, my friend Professor Esther Fuchs. Uh, you see her uh, bio in your package and you'll see that she uh, is a, a brilliant political analyst and uh, a fabulous teacher, which you won't find out in the bio, but she's won a lot of teaching awards at Columbia. She's also written some very interesting analyses of urban policy. And then, unlike a lot of my colleagues on the faculty, she had the courage to actually go out and try to do it uh, by, by being an advisor to uh, our mayor, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, today, though, uh, I think uh, Professor Fuchs is probably going to be known more as being uh, the daughter of Max Fuchs, uh, who, if you read the front page of the New York Times today, you'll hear about a, a cantor or a young cantor student who uh, said some prayers during the invasion of Germany. And, uh, that is Professor Fuchs's father. So for today, uh, I think we're going to probably hear, she'll probably hear a little bit more about her dad than about uh, Professor Fuchs, but it makes all of us very proud. So, uh, and I know her father pretty well, and, and uh, you know, it's, he's a great guy. So I just figured I should mention that since it's on my mind, and I know it's on Esther's mind. Um, so to, this panel uh, will be chaired by Professor Fuchs. Uh, she uh, has a lot of experience running really interesting panel discussions, so uh, I think you're in for a treat. It's always nice to have your friends introduce you, right? It is a special day in a lot of ways, but I am delighted to be here today at Princeton, uh, and um, I'm really uh, very pleased that the Earth Institute under Steve Cohen's leadership is co-sponsoring this day um, with the Woodrow Wilson School and um, I'm very lucky to be working with Steve Cohen and having him as a friend. Well this panel, and thank you Governor Florio, I have to say um, I've heard you speak several times but never in person up close like this and you get better and better all the time. That was great. <laughs> Our panel this morning is on <clears throat> excuse me, local government and sustainability in the region. Each one of those words has special meaning, um, so we'll focus on the interconnectedness between local government, sustainability, and the region. Environmental policy, as everybody in this room knows, has historically been viewed as a national responsibility. Local governments were expected to implement federal initiatives, as one of the questioners uh, asked before, um, would this be changing now? But it was really nothing more than implementing federal initiatives. Um, and of course, in the age of unfunded mandates, they also have had the responsibility to raise state and lo local taxes uh, to actually fund clean air, clean water, and clean land when essentially under the Bush administration, the federal government dramatically reduced its role in environmental protection and an extraordinary thing happened. Um, without regulation, legislation, and funding on environmental policy at the national level, and I'm not exaggerating, local and state governments stepped in and began creating their own environmental programs and they moved beyond traditional issues of clean water, recycling, and open space to really develop holistic plans for sustainability. In fact, while of course we have to attribute much of this to a citizen-led environmental movement, we have to really note that mayors across the country are now thinking about how environmental policy and economic development, as the governor alluded to, could be linked. How transportation and public health issues must be linked to clean air, clean water, and clean energy. So this is relatively new area in terms of creative policy making for our state and local governments. Uh, we are in for a treat this morning because some of the leaders in thinking about and implementing the most creative and far-sighted <coughs> sustainability plans and policies um, come from our region and are on our panel this morning. 
So without any more of my own ruminations here, it's my pleasure to introduce the members of our panel. And I will provide some uh, brief bios, and then we will hear from each panelist, and then we uh, will be open for questions. <coughs> Excuse me. On my right, usually on my left, actually I'm usually on your left, aren't I? Um, <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> Rit Agarwala. Rit is the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. In fact, he is the first director of that office. He is the creator of that office, in fact. There was probably no desks, no chairs, no nothing when he actually put it in place, and no people and no plan, more importantly. Uh, this office is charged with the creation of Plan NYC, a greener, greater New York, which I hope all of you know is New York City's comprehensive sustainability plan, which consists now of 127 separate initiatives to make New York City greener. Um, <clears throat> what I want to say, uh, more than Ritt's formal biography, is that without Ritt at the helm of this plan, I don't believe a, it would have been developed altogether, and B, it certainly wouldn't be implemented in the way it's been implemented now. He's an extraordinary thinker, and he's an extraordinary leader, somebody who understands the value of both listening and then stopping and just getting it done. So you have to be able to do both. And uh, I've had the real pleasure of working with him uh, at City Hall and on the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Board and up at Columbia. Ritt has a BA, an MBA, and a PhD from Columbia University. He got it all. And um, we're very proud to have him up at Columbia teaching now as an adjunct. Mark Allen Hughes, who I also happen to know, isn't that lovely? Okay. Mark is a distinguished senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design, where he teaches sustainability and <clears throat> the Penn T.C. Chan Center for Building Energy. He is formerly the chief policy advisor and founding director of the sustainability for the city of Philadelphia. And he too is an inspiration, as Steve talked about before, being able to be both a, an ac a first class academic as well as a first-class policymaker and crossing back and forth between those two worlds is fairly unusual, unfortunately. And Mark has really done it, and he's uh, done it in a way, I believe, that's a model. I hope a better model than your wife described, Governor. A model to the rest of us. <clears throat> he's the real deal, just as I know you are. Um, he, his research is published in virtually every major academic <coughs> journal. He was a vice president for policy development at uh, Public Private Ventures in Philadelphia. And he is a graduate of Swarthmore and received his PhD in regional science from Penn in 1986. And I know uh, New York City and, Penn and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia will be continuing um, to trade ideas and probably steal them from each other um, because of the relationships that um, Mark and Ritt have created for the cities. Now, um, I'm also really delighted to welcome Fred Profeta. Fred is the Deputy Mayor of Environmental Policy in Maplewood, New Jersey, and Chair of the New Jersey Mayor's Committee <clears throat> for a Green Future. And while I don't know you personally, I did Google you. I didn't just read the bio. And you're pretty amazing, I have to say. Those of us in New York who, you know, don't always have the nicest things to say about New Jersey. Of course, you know, it's just that friendly rivalry. <clears throat> Read about what Fred, Fred Profeta has done. Um, I think it's extraordinary to be able to be um, working and engaged civically and actually um, grow up in a place called Maplewood, New Jersey, and then be elected mayor of the township. And then beyond that, um, being named, having Maplewood being named Climate Champion of the Year because of the work you've done, um, I think it's just something that all our students t should aspire to. Um, Fred is also a New York lawyer specializing in appellate uh, litigation, and he is a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Law School. 
Finally, uh, Andrew Boros, who is my colleague at Columbia. Andrew is an adjunct research scientist at Columbia University's Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering, uh, <clears throat> working to implement the NOAA's Integrated Ocean Observing System and serves on the board for the Middle Atlantic effort. He teaches environmental policy as well as energy sustainability at the Earth Institute Center for Environmental Research and Conservation. It's very important that you pay attention to Andrew because for some of us, um, we tend to overthink things. Um, Andrew implements, he just doesn't think. And he understands the science, which of course we know in this world is critical to getting it right. He spent 10 years working in, trop in tropical rainforest conservation in West Africa and served for four years as chief of staff of a state legislative office and 12 years as executive director of the Bi-State Legislative, Legislative Commission between New York and New Jersey. I think that deserves a purple heart, I'm sure. Um, he has founded environmental societies both in Africa and the U.S and he holds a, a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a, and a BA in Psychology from Rutgers. It is a pleasure for me to introduce, I think, this extraordinary panel to you, and I'm gonna begin by asking uh, Rit Agarwala to start us off. Thank you. Um, uh, Sorry, I thought I would get away with being a little casual and staying in my seat, but not so. Um, I want to thank you, both uh, both the organizers here at Princeton and, of course, Steve, for um, for organizing this event and uh, and inviting me. And I'd like to echo Esther's remarks about the governor. Thank you for for that rundown. New Jersey uh, really has been, I think, the state um, that may even have gotten it more right than California. Um, the way I see it. Uh, California has solved the problem by spending an awful lot of money. And I think as we look back a few years from now, one of the things that will emerge as having been critical to really getting uh, energy efficiency going is, number one, actually doing it in a cost-effective way. And I think New Jersey's uh, done a better job of that than some of the other programs we've seen around the country. And actually getting to people. And I think one of the things that we're all struggling with uh, is that question of now that there are a lot of policy decisions that have been made, now that all of the cities that really matter actually have gotten, uh, big and small towns, um, have really developed their sustainability thinking. Now that the federal government has gone in the space, I, mean, I was actually thinking about this, um, about how it's only a year and a half ago, the United States government was in the business of denying that climate change was an issue, <laughs> right? It's only a year and a half ago. It is an amazing t thing to think of what has changed so quickly. Um, and it also uh, leads to, I think, one of the key, uh, key resources we have today, which is that there are plans to be implemented. Had we not had states and local governments using this vacuum of several years when not only weren't we thinking about this on a national level, but we were actively going the wrong way on a national level, the stimulus plan would not actually be implementable because we wouldn't know how to spend it. Right? Nobody would know. It, uh, thankfully, we had already started a year and a half ago in New York to think about a major process of upgrading city-owned buildings to do energy efficiency better um, because that gave us the, pro the plan, that gave us the staff, that gave us the thinking and the program to put through a lot of the money that we're going to get from the federal government. Otherwise, we would have had to start this from scratch. And so it, it reinforces to me something that you don't actually have to convince a planner of and probably don't have to convince too many policy students of, which is that even if you don't know exactly how you're going to get it done, you should always have a plan because times change and circumstances change. And if you had told us all two years ago that the United States government would be spending billions and billions of dollars on energy efficiency and expecting us all to uh, develop the programs to implement it, you would not have given that a lot of credence. It just wouldn't have been something that made sense. So. 
One of the, so I guess I am in fact quite grateful then for a couple of years when the federal government was not in the lead because it required us all to do our thinking ourselves. And I think that will also be something that stands the test of time. It's one thing to respond to a federal mandate. It's another thing to actually go through the process of figuring out what's important and how you're going to uh, plan for your own future. And that's really the story of Plan YC and one of the reasons that I think uh, it too will stand the test of time. We came by environmentalism honestly. We didn't start out with the desire to be green. Mayor Bloomberg has, you know, you may have heard he had a career in, in business prior to uh, running for public office. <laughs> um, he believes in long-term planning because that's the way he's run his business. And he doesn't run his business just to save the planet. He runs the business to achieve its own goals. And so when after the bulk of his first term, which I think it's safe to say was um, primarily focused on the need to stabilize the city after the attacks of September 11th. And when we realized that even despite those attacks in the first five years of the decade, between 2000 and 2005, New York City had added over 100,000 people net, added 100,000 people despite people moving out after those attacks, we knew that we were seeing a long-term growth trajectory that we had to get ahead of and had to start planning for. And so Plan YC, which I think most people think about today as being an environmental plan, really started out as a growth plan. What will it take? What city decisions have to be made? What resources have to be planned for? What uh, services will have to be provided to serve the city that we expect, and we think it's a conservative estimate, to go from the 8.1 million it was in 2000 to 8.4 million we think we'll see next year in the census to 9.1 million people in 2030 in a constrained urban environment where every uh, piece of land is spoken for, where any infrastructure project involves displacing, um, whether it's people or, or daily habits. And what was interesting about that, and the process that I think so many companies are going to have to go through uh, as we face this new world, is that we realized that just planning for our own future in a smart, hard-headed, honest way led us to answers that were all about efficiency and sustainability. Because if you have to find homes for a million new people in the five boroughs of New York City, the answer clearly cannot be more tracked housing because we don't have the space for that. It clearly cannot be piling more people into neighborhoods that are dependent on the automobile to get a quart of milk because one person means one more car on the road. So you actually have no choice but transit-oriented development. Uh, we had a habit for the last 50 or 100 years of when we needed more electricity, and the state of New York requires us to have 80% of our generating capacity in the five boroughs, that when we needed uh, more electricity, we would find a, an unattractive waterfront site in the outer boroughs, <coughs> usually in a minority neighborhood, um, where the property values were low and put a new power plant there. And of course, we no longer have unattractive waterfront neighborhoods in the four boroughs because we've done a really good job of reducing crime around the city. We now have a mayor who believes that environmental justice is something that has to be taken into account in policy decisions, and so the idea of just jumping, dumping more noxious uses into already burdened neighborhoods was not acceptable. And we've made a big push to use our waterfront, so we actually don't want to clutter the waterfront with more power plants, so what do you do? So the only answers become renewables and conservation and energy efficiency, and so that becomes a strategic need, not just something that we do for the planet, not just something we do because it sounds good, but because it's necessary for the long-term future of the city. And so in some ways, we wind up actually inverting the bumper sticker, right? That if you actually think locally, but in a smart, honest way, you wind up acting globally because you're going to do all of this together. And of course, at the same time, we realize that with 500 miles of coastline and a surface water system, New York City is particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So we are acting very much in our own self-interest by doing this. One of the things that uh, I think also we did well, in addition to learning and essentially bringing all of the city agencies, bringing the mayor himself through this thought process that you know I also didn't start out just as an environmental 
uh, person, I'm actually a transportation planner by background, um, is that we set clear targets and gave ourselves milestones. Because one of the things that I see now is that having had a lot of plans, a lot of visions come out over the last few years, we're now at a point where people are beginning to ask, well, how much have you actually achieved? And for a little while, you can get away with the idea that, well, it's a 20-year plan. You won't have seen much change just yet, but trust me, we're on schedule and we're doing fine. You get away with that for a little while, maybe for the first year. But after two years, people start asking, well, okay, really, what have you accomplished? And some things clearly do take a decade before you see results, but you need to be able to show where you thought you were going to be and how you quantify at least some of your initiatives. And so I've got some facts and figures, because when we came out with Plan YC, we not only said, here's where we want to be in 2030, but for each of the 127 initiatives in the plan, we said, here's where we need to be at the midpoint in 2015, and here's where we need to be at the end of 2009 when this mayoral term is up. And so I can tell you that for our annual report, and we do an annual report showing where we are on each of those 127 initiatives, that we are in fact roughly 66% on time or ahead of schedule to meet our target for the end of the year. The other 33%, now I know in, in, in certainly in Esther's class that would be a pretty poor grade to be only on time, 66%, but in government uh, it's not always so bad. We'll take it. Um, but the other thing is that most of the things where we are delayed were actually delayed because of changed capital spending patterns. So we're going to miss our targets by a year or two, but we haven't actually stopped work on them. Um, and then, of course, to have some examples of initiatives that really do grab the public's attention and are susceptible to quantification. And so two that have become really the uh, iconic initiatives within Plan YC, one is hybrid taxis. The yellow cab is, of course, one of the icons of New York City. They also are probably the best use anywhere on Earth for hybrid vehicle technology. Um, and we now, even though we lost, some of you may know, we lost two court cases in which uh, a federal judge decreed that we were preempted by the Clean Air Act from requiring our taxis to convert to hybrids. Savor the irony for me, um, you know, but nonetheless, and of course, we're working with our congressional delegation. In fact, we will probably try to amend the Clean Air Act to allow us to do this eminently logical thing. But what's interesting is that by talking about it, we actually got the taxi drivers to think about it for themselves. And today, without ever having had a regulation that was, in fact, enforceable, to require taxis to adopt hybrids, 21% of the taxis in New York City are already hybrid vehicles in just two years. 50% of all of the cabs being brought into the fleet, there are new cars brought in as they are retired every month, 50% of the new cars being brought into the fleet are hybrids. Virtually all of that is in the portion of New York City taxis that are owner-operated because it's those people who both make the decision to buy the car and pay for the gasoline, and so they've seen that this is actually a really smart move for them. Which also raises the question of the misaligned incentives which uh, bedevil not only the taxis, of course, but, the, um, but energy efficiency in buildings even more so. But so those taxis driving around the streets of New York with a little green YC sticker on them uh, showing people which ones are clean, I think is actually a real reinforcement for how we are making some progress. It's only one out of the 127 initiatives. The other one, of course, that has gotten so many people's attention is a million trees. Ten-year plan to plant a million trees, as long as you are keeping track, you can tell people how you are doing in terms of your progress. And so I know that at the end of the last planting season, which uh, concluded at the beginning of June, we had planted in two years, two years of working on this, 248,906 trees in New York City that were not there <laughs> on Earth Day in, 200, uh, in 2007. So in fact, we're only a handful of trees away from our quarter million goal for the end of this year, but we will aspire to uh, exceed that by a large chunk in the new planting season that starts in two weeks. That kind of ongoing measurement, I think, is one thing that 
can give the public confidence that you are actually doing what you said you were going to do. The other thing that I'd, I'd like to leave you with is the idea that plans have to evolve, that you have to build in a regular update, um, in part to make sure that the practice of long-term planning is not lost. Because I think that very interesting question that was asked about whether now that the federal government is taking the lead, will cities and states stop taking the lead? I think gets to the heart of the fact that most cities over the last 25 years did not do long-term planning because they were struggling to deal with federal mandates. Now we've begun this process, we have to renew it. And so one of the things that we did is we, we put in place a law in New York City that requires Plan YC to be updated every four years so that any point New York has a 20-year plan. The last time prior to Plan YC that this was done was 1969 under Mayor Lindsay. And we had to invent this process from scratch. This way there will be a, a momentum. This way the next plan will cover uh, through 2031. And then a couple of years after that there will be a 2035 plan. And so, as I started out by saying, we will never be in a position of not knowing what to do at any given point if there are large amounts of money, if there were to be a windfall. I mean, who knows, maybe we discover oil off of New York as we're uh, um, drilling or we're placing our offshore wind. You never know how things will change, but if you always have a vision, you've always thought through for yourself where you need to go, and you've given yourself clear standards, you at least will know, will know which direction you want to channel new opportunities <coughs> and new challenges to get to. And with that, I will leave you and listen to the rest of this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rhett. I just want to call on Mark Hughes now. Good morning, everyone. That's pretty good. You know, after spending an, a year with politicians, uh, I've learned you really got to kind of get a little bit more feedback than that. So good morning, everyone. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Well, you know, it's a sign of a good forum when just a few minutes into it, all one really wants to do is respond to things that have already been said. I almost wish I were the raconteur rather than a panelist because starting with, well, let me echo previous comments, the governor's extraordinarily sophisticated comments. I mean, reflecting a very deep understanding of a very wide array of the issues on this topic. Extremely useful context for all later speakers. And then following my longtime co-conspirator, Rear Agawal, um, many things I'd like to kind of respond to, as well as the sophisticated questions that have already emerged. So but let me try to do that during the course of some points that I would like to to put on the table for everyone. I have to pause, though, um, and respond to one thing that's been said already. The blushing, the blush-inducing introduction that my colleague, <laughs> Esther Fuchs, gave me, uh, you know, kind of the standard for introductions, at least as the introducee, is whether you really wish your mother had heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, a, that was one. I wish she'd heard. So thank you very much for those far overly generous comments. So, you know, it was 25 years ago, the first time I walked into this room, um, and two things have happened so far this morning that make me feel very old. First, everything looks a lot smaller. And second, one of my former students, who I will not embarrass by identified, came up and asked one of the questions and introduced himself with such a senior title that I know it was a long time since he was in my classroom. So I'll try to compose myself and limit um, my remarks. Actually, I'd like to begin. Anyone who's heard me speak has heard me say, use this quip. It's one of my favorites, that as an academic, I can speak for 10 minutes or two hours with no change in total content. <laughs> and I will stay much closer to that floor than the ceiling. But I also want to acknowledge that I learned that quip from my, the late Dean, Don Stokes, inside this room. So, absolutely, yeah, so. 
Uh, I want to focus mostly on the recovery proper in these very brief remarks, because now I really am looking forward to the Q&A, having heard, like, having gotten a taste of it already. Um, but let me start quickly with at least that opening paragraph about Greenworks. Right? Um, and let me thank Plan YC and RIT for the inspiration that they've provided in, for Philadelphia in the development of our own policy framework regarding sustainability. We have much in common, and that inspiration takes many forms, not the least of which is that it was a lot easier to know we had to generate 169 initiatives for Greenworks once we knew that Plan YC had 127. Right? So that inspiration really does come in a variety of ways. We also began from a very similar kind of uh, uh, counterfactual. I certainly am not an environmentalist, and the mayor, and really I believe the city as a whole, did not come to the sustainability commitment from an environmental agenda. Now, the dragon that we were trying to slay, unfortunately, sadly for us, is a very different dragon than that attempted to be slayed by RIT in Plan YC. We, the last thing, indeed, that we had to deal with was how to accommodate a growth of 100, uh, 1 million projected residents, right? Not a Philadelphia problem. Instead, the dragon we needed to try to slay was how to change the asset value of the city we had inherited from a liability, from a set of assets with depreciating values, to a set, a portfolio with appreciating values. And some of that had to do with aligning our inheritance with big changes in the world beyond our control. Identifying those changes and attempting to position that realignment. So that we were reframing Philadelphia <laughs> as an obsolete place to a city with and of the future. And one of the things that made that reliable was precisely the fact that those big changes were indeed beyond our control. This was not an advocacy based on Philadelphia as a warehouse of great need, which has certainly been the basis for our claims on other people's resources in the post-war period, but instead as a storehouse of great potential value that needed to be unlocked through leadership and policy reframing. And that's really what Greenworks attempts to do, and is something that I think it shares in common, although the substance is different, the strategy is similar, with Plan YC. It's not, it, it comes, as Ritz said, it comes to an environmental agenda honestly. It's really driven. It's not about, as we like to say in Philadelphia, it's not about polar ice caps or even polar bears. It's about poverty reduction. It's not, so it's about, I got lots of one-liners over the last year, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna regale you with them. But it is about an agenda that's driven, centered on competitiveness, and comes to the environmental issues, not coincidentally, but through argumentation, rather than a re opening commitment. So, we can talk a lot more about, in fact, in detail, the organic cows come home, on Greenworks itself, and what Philadelphia's trying to do. Let me instead step back a little bit and talk, you're, you're gonna, tap me, right, because I have no sense of time and stuff. I will just talk and talk. Um, the, uh, about the recovery itself, and again, this is going to ec uh, echo some of the things that have already been put on the table. I simply want to emphasize some of them. The recovery, while it has, I think we all hope and are beginning to see, actual instrumental value, it's also, I think many of us believe, part of a larger reform agenda. In some ways, the most sustained effects of the recovery we like to call in Philadelphia the stimulus, the recovery, will in fact be changing government practices. Now, the first of those, I think, was hoped to be inducing innovation. Now, I think, given the timetable that much of these funding decisions and allocations have been made, it really hasn't been about engendering innovation. It's really much more akin to what Ritt described. It really turns out it has been rewarding innovation. Right? The timelines for responding to many of these federal funding opportunities have been insufficient to allow places that were not previously prepared to respond smartly to them. And I will tell you, this is an ongoing challenge for Philadelphia across the whole array of opportunities, even the ones related to the green agenda. So this continues to be a real challenge. But let me give you another as aspect in which this innovation agenda is a little askew, which is as we shift from the formula to the competitive grant allocations in the recovery, 
So one of the things that we think in Pennsylvania is emerging is some competition between local governments and state governments. And in a way, what we're doing is finally facing off on some things that have been building over the past year that really started in the formula allocations. State governments were allowed to supplant many of their funding challenges, which is kind of what you want them to be, to some degree, in a position to do. Local governments were not. So the, between the fiscal stabilization and the education funding that occurred at the state level, there was really very little for local governments directly. This is one of the reasons for the second point I want to make, which is the importance, actually, you know what, before I do that, let me, ask, let me give you one more general comment, for hopefully for later discussion, on the recovery itself. It is also, to some degree, I believe, many of us, I think, believe, it's a dress rehearsal for bigger changes later. Not a second stimulus, probably, but instead for reauthorization. So that where reform is reliably occurring, I think probably as planned, if not within local governments, certainly among federal agencies. So that for the first time, all of this money coming down, which would have been formerly, in the very recent past, been treated as separate transportation, infrastructure, EPA, labor, and on and on and on, energy, decisions would have been treated as separate, are now being treated in Washington as parts of fairly well-established, still emerging, but high commitment and well-established at this stage, joint decision-making processes that are actually memorialized in MOUs and MOAs and new legislation regarding interagency collaboration. So much of the silo busting and everything else, many of us in, this, in these kinds of rooms have been talking about for a long time, is actually beginning to occur. Another thing that is happening at a different level of government is that within, while agencies are changing their relationships among, within the federal government, we're also beginning to see a roadmap for a multi-year strategy of changing the way the federal government relates to states and potentially to local governments as well. And that seems to be emerging and will be clearer in, say, transportation reauthorization than it has been so far in the recovery. So I think the recovery is a debut of many things that will probably have far bigger impacts and implications than even the substantial spending itself. So, but because the direct to local government funding was relatively limited in the almost $800 billion, that is one of the reasons why I want to focus in the minutes I have remaining on energy because two minutes, okay. I'm going to focus very quickly because one of the things that local governments did in fact get was a new funding title called the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant. Philadelphia got about $14 million for that. There are other reasons why energy is the key focus for much of this kind of conversation, even though there are many other things we could talk about. Much of the sustainability agenda is self-financing, not self-implementing, but self-financing through reduced operating costs related to energy. This is why we talk about municipal retrofits and so many other things. Energy for this and many other reasons is absolutely at the core of this conversation. Let me give you two examples from Philadelphia. We can follow up later in the Q&A if you're interested. As we move into the competitive phase of the environmental, uh, of the EECBG funding title, Philadelphia and actually my colleague Lori Actman, who's the director of the Metropolitan Caucus of our five southeastern Pennsylvania counties, is in the lead of this process. We will, as a region, be submitting an application, the most important element for this conversation of which is all of the constituent counties, Philadelphia being one, we are both a city and a county, a curse more than a blessing, have agreed to not betray, not defect, and apply separately. So we're making a, a regional application, big news in southeastern Pennsylvania, and it's all about energy. The second thing I'd love to tell you more about is the Smart Grid Investment Program that has been a $200 million application that PICO, our electric utility, has just submitted to DOT. It has a lot of very important features, one of which I'd like to simply label now, and maybe table for later discussion, is the importance of the regional scale for energy-related decision-making. I think one of the things that we're learning is that there is an energy shed scale that has qualities that are both instructive and useful, just like water sheds or food sheds. And that much of our ability to do things that have already been discussed so far, load shaping, peak demand response, the aggregation of long and short term 
per energy purchases, the ability to curtail expenditures through control, through the optimization of buildings, even the ability to organize things as like weatherization. There's a set of businesses and workers and job orders and so on that are comprehended by that policy challenge that operate at a regional scale. And all of these things come together in a way that I think it would be useful for us to understand better because energy is, has a place-making quality that operates at a regional scale and we lack any apparatus to fully exploit the possibilities of that energy shed. So I think that that's one of the more interesting, perhaps, aspects of some of the energy stuff that's on the horizon. Would love to talk with you more. I'm going to release the microphone to my next panelist colleague. Thank you. I'd like to invite Fred Profeta to the mic. Thank you, Professor. And Thank you for that very kind and generous uh, introduction also. I, by the way, Mark, I, I am going to tell my mother about it. <laughs> she's at uh, her 100th birthday party this weekend, oh. and I'm going to go. Oh, boy. She'll like to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thanks to Richard Keevey for inviting me here. I love to come and talk about uh, Maplewood and the Sustainable Jersey program that we have in this state. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about Maplewood too much today because I think the other is of more relevance for this group. Uh, but we are a very green community. Star Ledger calls us one of the five greenest in New Jersey. We've got some awards to demonstrate uh, our bona fides. If you Google us, you'll, you'll find that out. And actually, some of it's in my introductory material. Uh, we do have a, uh, uh, a LEED certified police building, the first LEED certified public building in New Jersey. We've got solar panels. We get our solar recs, and uh, we're going to do more of that. Uh, we've got, uh, we've pledged to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in our town 20 percent by 2015, trying to beat the state by five years. We'll see if we can do it. We did reduce our use of electricity and make residents, everybody, um, 6 percent in the last two years, and we've got programs that we push to get that result. So. We're proud of it, and if you want to uh, see more about it, uh, we have a new uh, website. Uh, I think it's maplewoodisgreen.org. Uh, it's just up. I'm not sure it's complete, but, and, and I, I'm told if you go on, it's green. I mean, it's really green. It's blinding green, so <laughs> be prepared for, for a shot when you see it. If you really want to see what Maplewood's all about, one of the things you could do is come to our annual green fair. We're having our next one October 10. It's called Maplewood Green Day. It's quite a success. Uh, we have over 100 exhibitions typically. We, we had 4,000 people come by last year. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good for a town of 24,000 people. We think it's one of the best in the state. Um, but what I want to focus on is this sustainable Jersey program because I think what we have here and what I can talk about today is how we can translate some of the principles we've been talking about um, into uh, reality, into facts on the ground. This is a practical program. And I, I submit, uh, to use uh, Mr. Keevey's language, that this program really does get a lot of bang for the buck. I mean, there are bucks involved, not too much, but it does take some. Uh, but I think it's very effective. What it is, it's a municipal certification program. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of all of the, of the actions. There's a big website sustainablejersey.com, and uh, um, I have some brochures here for folks who uh, 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 might want to take a look and uh, come to think of it, here's some extras for my colleagues here if you'd like to pass them down. Here's one here. Um, I, yeah, there's a fellow on the panel here this afternoon, Randy Solomon, who's the executive director of the New Jersey, New Jersey Sustainable State Institute. He, he did a lot of the academic work devising this. I think he'll probably talk about that uh, later on the next panel, so I'll leave that for him. Uh, but what I want to focus on is the history of this program, its rationale, how we got there, and why I think it really works. And I think I can demonstrate to you that it does work. Uh, this all started with the New Jersey League of Municipalities, to, as to, um, and, and almost every municipality in New Jersey belongs to this. There's a fellow, very effective executive director, whom many of you may know, named Bill Dressel, 
Uh, it was his idea about four years ago. He, he knew I was sort of a greenie. And there's another, was another mayor in, in, in New Jersey, Merrill Frank of Highland Park, who certainly had done a whole lot. And he put us together and he said, why don't you two just get together and discuss how we could achieve some uh, environmental progress on a statewide basis and come up with some ideas. So we brought in other mayors, Merrill and I, and uh, we called ourselves the Mayor's Committee for a Green Future. Uh, I'm not in love with that name, but I'm told it's been branded now, so we'll, we'll continue to use it. But that's, that's our name. And we presently have 13 mayors or mayor's designees on this committee. Uh, Newark's represented, Trenton's represented. We have towns all the way from uh, Ocean City, uh, in Cape May County, all the way up to Bergen County. So it's a statewide, it, we've done that consciously. We've tried to be diverse in, very, in many ways, certainly geographically. Uh, Merrill and I were the co-chairs. She went off to uh, become the ambassador to the UN for Women's Affairs. So. I'm now the chair, and uh, a woman by the name of Pam Mount, who's mayor of Lawrence Township, is the vice chair, a very effective one. We meet monthly at the Blaustein School at Rutgers. Um, now, when we first organized, one of the first things we did was uh, to brainstorm our policy and uh, figure out how we were going to make a difference. Because we weren't going to make a difference, it was just going to be a talk group. Didn't seem to be worth it. Uh, and we actually came up with two propositions. Uh, first, we concluded that much of the environmental degradation in our states, in our, in our state, in our towns, in the, in the country, in the world, is caused by individual behavior. And I think, you know, you can see that. Uh, it's not too hard to demonstrate that. With greenhouse gas emissions, for example, lots of it, I forget the percentage, is caused by manufacturing and agriculture. But so much of that, of course, is, is, is determined by consumer decisions, what we buy, what we eat etc. 25 percent is caused by power plant emissions, but how much of that is caused by when we decide to turn the lights on or turn them off or where we set the thermostat. And we try very hard to affect that behavior in Maplewood. That's one of the things we've really emphasized. 33 percent of the emissions are caused by vehicles, at least in this state. Uh, but a lot of that depends on whether you decide to buy the hybrid or the SUV. And uh, in Maplewood now, you, every time you turn a corner, you're going to run into a hybrid. And we get mad at the SUVs. Uh, the second proposition that we came up with was, okay, so it's individual behavior. That's what we're going to focus on. Well, we think that the level of government that's best able to make a difference in individual behavior is local government. And that was self-evident to us, mayors. We thought, you know, we're seeing the folks on the street corners, at the shopping mall, at the train station, in the schools, and we talk. That's what we do. And we campaign, and we talk about these sorts of things. Uh, and that was a premise, that, that we are good at changing individual behavior. Now, one of the things about New Jersey that, was re that really facilitated this is we've got 566 municipalities in the state. Every square inch of this state is incorporated. You know, for some purposes, that's just crazy. It doesn't help us when it comes to our taxes. But at least in this regard, it provided us with a lot of leverage because we got 566 points of contact with individual behavior. And we thought that, that we, would, we would try to... Uh, uh, take advantage of that. I can tell you that in Europe, there's a lot of emphasis on, municip on municipal behavior. I was at an uh, international conference in Copenhagen in May uh, on four municipalities, and boy, the emphasis there. Each little town has their own program. They've got their own solar, their own wind. There, there, are, there are towns with, 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 that are approaching 100% uh, renewable energy and a, and a zero uh, carbon footprint. Copenhagen has that as its goal, and it's quite incredible to see how they do it over there. Okay, so then the mayor's committee, we talked about how we were gonna, this rationale we had, how we we're gonna actually apply this on the ground. Uh, there was one theory which said, well, look, we're green towns, we'll go out and we'll talk to folks about what we do and we'll lead by example. And they'll say, okay, that looks great, so we'll copy that. Uh, and we did a little bit of that, but others in the committee wanted to be more rigorous and these, these folks actually ultimately won the debate. So what we did, we came up with the three-pronged approach, and that's the basis for the Sustainable Jersey program. First, we were going to create really rigorous, objective, provable, measurable criteria to determine whether a municipality is actually sustainable. Uh, you know, no, no airy stuff, real, real uh, objective stuff. And then we were going to present tools 
to people in the municipalities to get this done. One thing about one thing we all knew as mayors is, is environmental uh, information is complicated. And we all, we all knew as mayors that we got a zillion other things to do, from the police to the schools to the roads and everything else. It's hard to do this. So we needed people to put it together in, in one-stop shopping, for, is what we called it, or environment for dummies is another way we referred to it. But we wanted that kind of uh, ability. And then we wanted to tie some kind of incentives in there, in there to make it good. Financial incentives would be great to make it appealing to folks to follow this program. And then we got lucky because Bill Dressel again realized that at Rutgers they were, they were doing a municipal certification program, but they didn't have the conduit to the people, so to speak. And so we partnered with them and also with the College of New Jersey, and we formed this group called the Sustainable Communities Working Group, a, a group of 150 experts, uh, all the way from government, local government officials, mayors and others, uh, academics, business people, people from state agencies, and they brainstormed this stuff for the better part, well, more than, actually, a year, and came up with these criteria by which we would define sustainability. Uh, and um, we then ran it by the mayors to see if it was really doable. So there was this interchange all along. Uh, we launched this program in February of this last year in Trenton. Governor Corzine was there and was very helpful in giving a very supporting speech. The heads of most of the departments were there, so we got a lot of good push from that. Uh, so here is the program. I mean, basically what it is is uh, a, a number of areas where towns or municipalities should operate. And we have one in community partnership and outreach, diversity and equity, because we think that you need that for sustainability, energy efficiency, greenhouse gases, green design, health and wellness, another one. Uh, and under these categories, and I could go on with all of them, but you can check the website or take a look at this brochure, we have very specific actions. For example, uh, under energy efficiency, a required one is energy audits for municipal buildings. You've got to do that if you want to, if you want to qualify for this program. Energy Star buildings. Under greenhouse gases, you've got to do a municipal carbon footprint. You should have a climate action plan. And for all of these things, you get points from 10 points to 30 points. And if you get 100 points, you qualify as sustainable. And as I said, we have uh, hooked this in uh, to, find, to financial incentives by having the DEP and the BPU uh, give money to towns who are pursuing this. As, as one of the, if you are signed up for the Sustainable Jersey program, then that's a, that's a criteria that helps you qualify for uh, state money. Um, the deadline is today for submitting your proof for this. Uh, we're going to hand out awards in November. I don't know how many are going to actually make it, but I will tell you that over 200 municipalities have actually signed up for this by passing a governmental resolution saying we're serious and here are the actions we are pursuing. That's over one-third of the state. And, and, and one of the reasons why I think that's happened is because a lot of this makes financial sense. If I had more time, I'd go into those details. But uh, one of the, every county in the state is represented and most interesting fact, of these 200 some odd towns that have signed up for it, one half are led by Republicans and one half by Democrats. And I think a lot of that has to do with the financial aspects of it. So we're very happy about that. Other states have contacted us. They want to replicate this. A challenge there is we do want people to copy it. We just want them to do it right. So we're trying to figure out how we're going to trade that, how we're going to do it. Why is this successful? Well, I'll tell you, I think that there's something unique about this program. And that is that what we have done is we have taken the know-how, the expertise of the academics, like Randy right there, who's walked in, and, 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 and they have crafted very serious objective. Uh, they, they tell us what, what environmental steps make a real difference. But then the mayors decide whether what is doable. And then more importantly, the mayors have had an ability to go out and preach this. I go and visit two or three towns a month. I love talking about this stuff, getting people to sign up for it. That's what's made a big difference, and that's why we're happy about this. So we're going to be embarking on uh, year two pretty soon. Uh, there's more to say about that, but uh, I will uh, close my remarks by, by saying if anybody have any further questions on it, please get in touch with me. We'll be having a big uh, 
explanation, a big description of all this, a big show, really, in Atlantic City in November when we hand out our certifications. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, finally, our final speaker is Andrew Vertos. Thank you. Thanks. Is there, is there feedback from this microphone, or can you hear? Can you hear OK? Yes? Good. Um, I've lived and worked in both New York and New Jersey. And uh, now I live in New Jersey and work in New York. So, so I, too, will plug uh, New Jersey. I, I'll remind everybody that Ben Franklin called New Jersey the keg that's tapped at both ends between Philadelphia and New York. But in the spirit of regionality, uh, as Mr. Argawala pointed out, Manhattan has a minimum requirement for, New York City has a minimum requirement for dedicated power generation. Some of that power generation is generated in New Jersey at dedicated power plants and passed underneath the Hudson over to the city. And uh, as far as Philadelphia is concerned, everybody west of Philadelphia considers Philadelphia part of New Jersey anyway. <laughs> so so uh, we're, all, we're all one big happy family. I'm going to, because we have these powerhouses, uh, here on either side of us and, and the, the award-winning Maplewood uh, program. I'm going to confine my remarks to the more local side of things. I do want to ask how many people here are from a, a representative municipality in some particular way? Oh, who are all the rest of you? <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Um, but I will stick with the topic of this discussion anyway, and that's uh, sustainability and local governments. Um, Esther mentioned that I spent a good deal of time in Africa, and um, um, it gives me, I, I'd like to think that it gives me a rare perspective because I lived in an area, um, in small villages and isolated areas that were in fact sustainable. And uh, saw how that worked, and it was because those people have been doing, are doing what they've been doing for 500 years. And instead of going for the unlimited growth philosophy, they, they found uh, sustainability and, and uh, the balance that Governor Florio was talking about before. Um, I'll also mention uh, that, that I'm informed by my experience having been there when Charles Taylor was coming into Monrovia in uh, 1990. And I spent the last two months of my time in Africa working, uh, delivering UN food aid to uh, people who were trapped in refugee camps. Uh, uh, so I saw uh, what was a small, happy, pretty close to sustainable country, it had its problems, Liberia, um, go to uh, be tipped into probably permanent unsustainability. So there's the truism that, that uh, we will become sustainable one way or another, either with our cooperation and planning or it's going to happen to us. And, and I have seen that. I have seen that happen. And so when people talk about that, then it raises a very different picture for me. That's, that's very sharp. For my troubles in my last two months, I spent my last 10 days uh, in prison as a guest of the soon-to-be former president before Taylor actually came into Monrovia. Uh, I'm going to touch on some of the topics that, that everybody came here to hear, along with the rest of these folks. And uh, that is uh, how we, we might be able to apply stimulus funding to sustainability. But first, I want to quickly touch on the state of sustainability. The concept of sustainability is out of the gate. A lot of people are very familiar with it. But at the same time, now I've spoken to officials in New York, New Jersey, and then also in Roanoke and Blacksburg, Virginia, that are two very good models for sustainability programs and municipalities. And uh, uh, I was talking to a mayor of New Jersey, very sharp, savvy guy. And a couple of months ago, and I said to him, what are you guys doing about sustainability? And he said, uh, and, uh, and it was the first time I've ever seen him speechless. And he had to think about it for a second, and then he said a few things about what they're doing environmentally, and then he directed me to the Environmental Commission. So, uh, so in fact, I would, I would sound a note of caution and say that sustainability is the buzzword today. And uh, other words have been co-opted by uh, interests inimical to the original intent. Perfect example is the term organic. Okay, organic meant something. Today, it doesn't mean what it meant. And you have USDA organic. And so I, I would caution that, don't take it for granted that everybody knows exactly what sustainability means. Uh, somebody in Roanoke said to me, who's involved in sustainability down there, that, that that is because everybody from the top down has told everyone that they have to be sustainable but they never told them what that is exactly. 
So uh, I just urge you to carefully define in your municipalities what exactly you mean by sustainability and what exactly it means, because if you don't define it, someone in the future is going to define it for you in terms that are going to be to their interests. Now, true sustainability, we, we keep hearing the three, the three legs of the stool today. Um, true sustainability, depending on your construct, either stands on three legs, or it's a Venn diagram with three overlapping circles. Or if you're, a, if you're a Vandana Shiva, it's a pyramid with the environment at the very base of it and being most important. Um, all of these versions try to capture the relationships amongst environmental, social, and economic sustainability. Okay? Now, uh, one municipal official in Virginia actually pointed out to me that people do get the environmental sustainability part of it but that the social and economic aspects are still not generally grasped by the public. So the spectrum of existing efforts range from very straightforward, aimed, uh, those aimed solely at the environmental sustainability of local government institutions, and they do energy audits and look at their vehicle emissions and so on, um, to very holistic approaches that cover the full range of sustainability issues. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, we're, we're all, we all live and breathe sustainability. But it's still important to remember that a lot of people don't. A lot of people are still somewhat confused by it. Um, coming from a background that, that uh, looks at things regionally, Governor Florio, I mentioned to him this morning, signed the bill creating the commission that I ran for 12 years between New York and New Jersey that looked at marine and coastal issues between the two states. I was wondering if 566 individual efforts in New Jersey at sustainability made sense. And uh, especially when, you know, in contrast, we have 566 municipalities and we have 605 school districts. So now we're going to have 566 efforts at sustainability. And in, in actual fact, on long reflection, I think that that's the way it absolutely has to be. Because community action and community energy gets focused when people are locally involved. And it comes from the bottom up. It can't be coming from the top down. The Stimulus Act, very quickly. Now the question this morning is, what sustainability programs could receive stimulus funding? So, quick look at the Stimulus Act. It seeks to provide seed money for short turnaround projects that put people to work. Okay, it's picks and shovels, more bricks and mortar, no, no paperwork and uh, consultants, which in and of itself is not very sustainable. Uh, secondary benefits are great if you get them, but not a requirement. Now, what projects fit into this criteria that provide the greatest local impact and not only stimulate the economy, but sustainability as well? Now, that's a straightforward research question and suitable for the role of academics in the research community. And uh, what I would like to see is uh, the answer to what, has, uh, what have sustainability groups done that have succeeded? What problems did they address? What was the outcome and how much did it cost? And there are a lot of resources out there. That's a really good one, Sustainable Jersey is. And then there are several others. All you have to do is get on the internet. But uh, there is no one place where you can look at these ideas and see them, sort them by cost, by problem, by, uh, by uh, how successful they were. And that kind of a cookbook approach, to some extent, would help a lot of local municipalities to uh, to begin the programs that they're going to have to they're going to have to proceed with. Now let's take a quick look at three efforts that I would like to note that's a little bit different than all the big programs that we've talked about here. Um, in talking to a lot of folks around, uh, one of the big successes that is very 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 implementable and it's just ripe for sustainability funding is community gardens. Okay. Community gardens take advantage of several opportunities and they alleviate several problems. Vacant land and just land that the municipality has to maintain is always an issue and a problem. It's there, it's ready to go. To get people involved in actually growing their own food on it is very, very minimal work. In Roanoke, they're, uh, they're estimating that you need one garden for every 7,000 population, usefully and that it takes one person to supervise 20 gardens. They've got them up and running in Ro Roanoke, and the average cost to start one, 
750 to $1,000. Um, when people are growing their own food in an area, in their own neighborhoods and own yards, that is a lesson in sustainability that's really difficult to match anywhere else. And talk about ancillary benefits, I mean the entire Michael Pollan thing and the local food movement and so on, it really is something useful for students to see and for people to see in their own neighborhoods. Uh, the two things that most municipal officials cite when they talk about trying to attack sustainability issues is transportation. Somebody had a transportation question this morning for the governor. Um, usually in reducing vehicle miles and then tightening the home insulation envelope. I came across a very interesting, as a matter of fact, North Brunswick, New Jersey, just north of here, um, has a large area owned by Johnson & Johnson. It's reverted back to the city. They control it and they're actually taking a look at putting a train station in because there isn't one between Princeton and New Brunswick and uh, doing a number of ancillary things, doing something along the lines of a smart growth village in the area and uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with other things like community gardens and so on. Uh, in several communities in the country, uh, municipalities have actually bought vehicles that they rent out at an hour at a time that they maintain in places where people absolutely have to have a vehicle to be able to do something at some point in time. Roanoke's taken that one step further and, uh, and have, starting with the storehouse that the police maintain for stolen bicycles, got about 3,000 bicycles donated to them. They repaired them, painted them yellow, and left them in public places. Anybody who needs a bicycle gets on the bicycle, goes to where they're going, and leaves it in a public place. Now, imagine doing that in some communities in New Jersey. But, but uh, first, first few months, average attrition rate, 10%, 10% a month. But pretty soon, the kids who are stealing the bicycles realize that when you always have one handy, you don't need to keep one at home. <laughs> and nobody's stealing them anymore. Final example, and this is the one that I just thought was really, really something. Now, sustainability, true sustainability, is going to have to take a look at the economic and social, social aspects, as well as the environmental aspects that everybody is so really focused on. I never thought I would see a program that actually attacks those two legs of the stool. And I found one, uh, to my amazement, in upstate New York, in Ithaca. I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, beginning in 1991, 18 years ago, they created a local currency called Ithaca Hours, H-O-U-R-S. Printed their own money, says in Ithaca we trust on it, and uh, one hour is worth about 10 US dollars. Now, that's something that you really take, need to take a look at on the internet because it's a more complicated story, but long story short, today they have 500 vendors in town that accept Ithaca hours. You have to spend them locally. Restaurants are now paying people in Ithaca hours. They give 0% loans in Ithaca hours to small businesses. And it's something that has helped the local food movement, the local library takes them, the local hospital takes them. And as of just yesterday afternoon, believe it or not, the city bus system takes them. And it has created a locally sustainable economic network of people that work together towards maintaining their community. It's something well worth looking at. So those are the, my, my three quick examples. And I'll finish up, thanks. Um, I'd like to invite our members of the audience to come up to the mic uh, to ask questions. And while uh, people are ambling down, uh, I want to pose a question to all the panelists uh, for them to respond to. Uh, everybody's talked about um, the role of local government, obviously, in environmental and sustainable policy. Um, I'd like you all to address from the perspectives of your own work uh, this issue of collaboration. When you start combining sustainability with economic development, which invariably, as all the panelists have said, you must, you, can, you, you won't be able to have environmental sustainability without economic sustainability, 
The issue of collaboration changes. Um, we live in a federal system where New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Pennsylvania um, have a states which have different tax structures which compete with each other for businesses. So how do we focus on issues that allow our region to collaborate <coughs> both from an economic as well as an environmental sustainability is, uh, perspective. And please feel free to talk also about the role of um, private institutions and not-for-profits and universities in creating these kinds of collaborations. So why don't I start from left to right and um, have you begin. Well, let me just very briefly throw one, one thought on in response to that great question. Um, I would start with paying some attention, especially because they remain in such flux, with the incentives that are handed down to states and potentially regions from federal government titles. I think, again, this is to kind of follow up on some of the things we've already talked about a little bit, but. I think many of us expect in reauthorization, but also in some of the decisions still pending regarding recovery funding proper, to reward that collaboration. If we begin with those rewards, we're going to induce a little bit of it, especially among those players who are already inclined to do so, but are not quite fully incentivized to deal with the complications that come from it. And one of the examples, I think, of this is you, know, you can be, we can all be as collusive as we want to be uh, in making this happen. Um, I remember a senator named Bradley who was instrumental in getting a set-aside for a two-state empowerment zone um, back in the Clinton administration when we were doing empowerment zones in enterprise communities, and that was largely designed to create a Philadelphia Camden win in the selection. So, thinking about ways in which we can kind of structure some of the federal incentives in order to help produce some of that collaboration. And I've, I'm going to stop so I have time for others, but the university question is also very important. So you can either look to someone else to talk about that or I'm happy to come back. Uh, le let's do this quickly because we obviously have a lot of questions here, but I want everybody to get a chance to respond. Fred? Professor, I, I'm having trouble he hearing the speaker in here because of the feedback. Could you just summarize the question? I didn't quite oh, get it. Oh, okay. It was just about regional collaboration and what are the incentives to create it because Basically, our federal system is structured to disincentivize collaboration, and clearly, in the environmental policy arena, we all benefit from it. But from an economic point of view, the governments don't have the, the incentive to do it now. Well, one of the ways is to engage uh, the private sector in, in, in ways that can help uh, local and regional efforts. So we. Uh, there are, there are many incentives, as the governor mentioned before, with respect, for example, to solar, uh, where uh, the ability now to get private money to invest in, in, in renewable energy because of the tax credits and the depreciation and the solar X are, are there, and, and it is actually municipal governments and local governments, county governments, which can take advantage of this uh, better than anybody else because they don't. They're, t they're, they're, tax ex they're tax exempt, so the tax incentives mean no, make no difference to them. This is an example where, because of federal program, private money can be brought to bear and solve, in a large way, uh, local problems. Thanks. Andrew? You'll have to excuse my voice, as you can tell I'm fighting a, a cold here. Uh, the, uh, I'll point out that Virginia Tech and uh, Blacksburg have a very close collaboration, and I know that Princeton and uh, Princeton Township has a program, uh, Rutgers University has a program. I think that, um, as I mentioned before, with 566 municipalities, it's, uh, it's important that things do begin locally, and I think that as the, the local problems become more solved and under control, and regional issues begin to show up, you know, there's a power line coming across the highlands from, from Pennsylvania into New Jersey, and uh, that's going to require some kind of local regional cooperation, and I'm a big believer in in, uh, in local incentives growing as needed to fill that, that, uh, that kind of, a, of a, a problem. Thank you. Rip. Um, just very quickly, I think, you know, what we need to do is, number one, I, I guess I'm a little bit of a curmudgeon when it comes to collaboration, um, not just because I'm selfish, um, <laughs> but also because collaboration introduces friction. 
right? And so the collaboration has to create more value than the cost of doing things jointly, which means that in order to make a collaborative effort worthwhile, it has to be something that naturally does span boundaries. Um, the best case for that is obviously transportation, which by definition is about connecting places. And I, I would argue, and I, I think Mark's idea of a, an energy shed is a really interesting way to look at it because there you could find all the places where there are increasing returns to collaboration. But really the place that I think cries out most for federal um, <coughs> rules to incentivize collaboration is in transportation projects because we are stuck with this concept of the lead agency which leads us to plan a new rail tunnel that's going to stop at Penn Station and, and things like that. So. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have a lot of questions. Why don't we begin on the right? Thank you. Um, I've been to probably hundreds and hundreds of sustainability conferences in New Jersey and occasionally in Philadelphia and, and New York, and I often find myself raising some issues that uh, it seems like we're not yet ready to face. And while I applaud and recognize the progress that y you've all talked about today, uh, there's one that's just to me gnawing at me that it, it hasn't come up, particularly because I think the most eloquent spokes uh, group for it is a co-sponsor of this conference, and that's Columbia's Earth Institute. And I've been to many forums there, and nobody's better at explaining how what we learn in Environmental 101 that we're all connected is actually really true, and even at the local level. So I would just urge the, the people that are at this conference today to give some thought, I mean, I'm, I have no illusions that the local level is going to be the major force in addressing the problems of poor countries in the world and achieving the Millennium Development Goals, but I think there's some possibilities from fair trade to sister city relationships uh, uh, and some other possibilities that I think are, are not being given some serious thought. So it's just a, a, a wish for us to think about Thank that. Thank you. That's a very important point. And just to address that for the whole panel, I can give you a, there's a wonderful example. New York has created a not-for-profit that is run out of the New York City Commission, which you might want to take a look at for the United Nations. And it's called Global Partners. In fact, Rick w uh, helped me organize a conference on sustainability and um, climate change and public health uh, last year. And it is actually addresses this issue of sharing best practices across cities across the globe. And uh, I think every city in this region, to the extent they have the resources, is actually doing that now. But it's important, and I thank you. Uh, next question on the left. My name is Joseph Musso. I'm a student at the School of International and Public Affairs. My question had initially been directed towards the governor, but after listening to the panel, the panel, it's evolved incredibly, so I apologize if it comes out as rather complicated. Okay, uh, go for it. Well, listening to the talk about long-term planning, and we have representatives of uh, three city municipalities between Plan NYC and also former representative of Philadelphia and a representative of Maplewood, I'm curious uh, how education and training for education is coming into play in the development for, uh, of sustainability. I know that um, Dr. Hughes mentioned previously that he believes in uh, poverty reduction. And to that end, education is a major front. OK, this is a great question. So in the interest of time, I'm going to ask uh, Rit and Mark to address that question. And we'll trade off among our panelists. You want to start, Rit? Um, sure. You know, I, we are, we didn't, when we wrote the plan in 2007, actually have a shortage of jobs in New York City. Um, obviously, it's not that New York is without poverty, but so we started out really focused on a set of outcomes that had to do with the sustainability of the city. Is there enough housing? Is there enough um, what have you? The way we think about the job creation opportunities is figure out what we need to do and figure out what jobs will be created and what training is needed to fill those jobs. And so the best example and the biggest single opportunity for green job growth in New York City is in retrofitting existing buildings. We've put forward a set of proposals uh, to require ongoing efficiency upgrades of large buildings in New York City. We're going through the process of figuring out 
how many jobs of each type will that create, and how do we ensure that we have the trained workforce, and then how do you provide the training to fill the gap? Because it can well be that a lot of the skills already exist and just need to be repurposed. But what training is needed, we will try to provide. Again, uh, very briefly, I'll just add to, because um, I could repeat many things going on in Philadelphia as well, regarding the, the labor supply pipeline the necessary to fulfill a lot of the demand that both policy is helping to generate and that you know, these larger realities is driving as well. Related to retrofits, also to, we have an explicit jobs goal within the 15 targets in Greenworks. We also have an explicit food goal and an explicit retrofit goal that feed directly into that jobs goal. So. Um, there's a lot on that side and that creates demand for education, but I want to talk about a different aspect of your question uh, by way of response, which is that education is also a source, an institutional source for one of the greatest constituencies for the implementation in particular of this agenda. So that you know, if it is about the future, younger people are going to be spending a larger fraction of their time in that future than we are. So when we're talking about green rooms, we're talking about their rooms. When we're talking about green jobs, we're talking about their jobs. So that we're also attempting to tap school children right, and education through the kind of whole distribution of education as a constituency, a partner in the actual implementation of these goals, which I think implicates then the curriculum that they study, the um, advocacy that they represent and trying to move them beyond important first steps like recycling in their dorms, right? Universities have been at the forefront of institutional leadership on this as corporate entities because of demands placed on them by their students. So we're trying to uh, take that energy and expand it into a larger set of policy challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. My name is Andrea Kahn. I'm with McManaman in Scotland, and I'm a bond attorney who represents a lot of school districts um, in implementing energy savings improvement programs and uh, renewable uh, energy um, uh, structures. Uh, the legislation that Governor Florio mentioned that extended the period to 15 years for certain types of contracts, the way it's been interpreted by the Department of Ed uh, the school districts cannot get facilities aid under those four energy, uh, four solar projects and other renewable projects. They can only get it if they go to referendum. And of course, it's difficult to pass uh, referenda. So um, we have to go to the public and we have to make a presentation. And number one, we have to convince the school district to actually put the question up when they're afraid that the increased uh, capital cost is going to defeat their entire school capital project. And then assuming that we can get past okay, we that need hurdle. A question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It's fascinating, but we have so many. Sorry. Things. Okay. How do we convince the uh, local governments, the school districts, to number one, put it up, and number two, once it's put up, um, uh, to convince the public to vote for it when there is a large capital cost up front? Uh, that's a great question. I'm going to ask Fred to start on that since he has the most experience with local government, although I know. Um, RIT has a lot of experience in engaging the public, and so does Mark and Andrew uh, on, their, on their issues. So whoever else wants to chime in after Fred, I'll take uh, two, two responses. Well, one of the ways to convince the public is to demonstrate that uh, there is a net savings. Uh, for example, on the police station that I talked about in Maplewood, uh, the, uh, the annual uh, cost on the bond to the debt service on the bond to put in the environmental features uh, is, is, is less, cost less than the, uh, the money that we save uh, on the renewable energy and the other features, light and so forth. So if you can get that kind of equation and your local officials can make that case convincingly, then uh, that's going to be appealing to the public. Uh, the other thing, of course, is what I mentioned before, and that is because of the, and, and you know this better than anybody, because of the tax incentives and the, and, and the solar X and the other aspects, the other than the rebates in certain situations that apply, um, it's easy now for, for municipalities to, to, to attract private money for these installations. And there, the investment by the municipality is zero. And they get, they get renewable energy cheaper than they would in the market. So this is a, you know, th this, uh, that information has to get out there. And, uh, and we're trying to do it in an organized way. Okay, I'm going to take the next question and just identify yourself and hit the question. Hit right into it. 
Uh, Mike Leganton, I'm Vice President for Environment, Energy, and Transportation with the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce. Fred, I know uh, Bill, he's our next door neighbor, and I uh, serve on the Clean Air Council at the NJDEP with Pam Mao. My question is, uh, at the State Chamber, our Board of Directors and Governor Florio has been very much engaged with our organization, is looking at the whole green energy, green economy, green jobs. Uh, short question, is there a model that we can use to use sustainable Jersey that you've done for the locals on the business side to apply those same benchmarks, engage possibly small business uh, in this growing area, Couple with for are there models, success stories in Philly and New York that you guys can share with us? Okay, I'm going to ask Andrew to start on that on successful models and the issue of uh, valuation because I know you've worked in that in a variety of different environments, and uh, then we'll try and get in one more response. <laughs> you, you know, I'll, honestly, I work in ocean and atmospheric models mostly, so actually, I'm, I'm going to pass on. You want to pass one. on it? Okay. <laughs> Do you, Okay, so why don't we go, why don't you take, why don't you start off again um, and uh, Mark, and then we'll have uh, Rich jump in. Okay, good. Well, let me give you one, one example, um, which is uh, a green office compact that has just been established in Philadelphia that tries to overcome one of the more nagging challenges on the specific subject of building retrofits, the split incentives that the owners and occupants of buildings, especially rented buildings, often have, right? So that you don't, you can't fully internalize all of that self-financing savings that we all keep on talking about in that particular setting. And so as a partial resolution of that, the best place to ultimately resolve that is in the lease itself. But as one way to begin that conversation, there's a new voluntary program in Philadelphia for the tenants of you know the 45 million square feet of commercial office space that we've got um, in downtown Philadelphia that is about um, signing on to become a advocate for and a demander of and a certified provider if your landlord isn't a whole array of things regarding your purchasing of supplies your recycling commitment and so on to try to create a little bit of the branding, the return, right? I mean, a lot of stuff coming in now about the returns to corporate entities of PSAs devoted to green stuff, often green washing, rather than paid advertising. Try to get a little certification there that mobilizes them, but also to aggregate that demand to try to better educate the commercial tenant marketplace. Okay. That's great. I'd like to follow up with you uh, on that. Yeah. That's about all I know about it, but yeah. I'm happy. But those are good models, yeah. And uh, Rick's going to respond to sure. I think there's. Um, one thing that I'd urge you to, to encourage your members to do is rather than signing a pledge for a couple of things uh, um, is actually get them to solve their own problems. Um, the best single example of the application of sustainability in the corporate world, I think, is what Ray Anderson has done at Interface Floor. Um, some of you may know of his work, but it's a carpet company. Their product is woven petroleum, right, if you want to think <laughs> about it that way. And they undertook a massive efficiency effort to rethink their facilities, rethink how they were using resources. They've become nearly carbon neutral as a firm. They've doubled their profit margins. What was the name of the company? Interface Floor. Okay. It's, uh, I believe it's the largest provider of uh, carpet tiles in the United States now. And that is a model uh, that we've kind of used as well, where, for example, we got the 10 largest universities <coughs> in New York to join us in, in matching what the mayor aspires to do for city buildings, which is a 30% cut in energy use, which has huge returns to the taxpayers. These universities have worked with us jointly. We provided somebody to help do their carbon analysis, but really they each came up with their own action plans, essentially, to cut their energy consumption because it's their plan and it's solving their problem. Right. right? These are now things that we don't have to encourage them to follow through on. And I think that ownership is critical. Thank you. One more question. I'm sorry, We're, we've run out of time. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Julia Zuckerman. I'm a master's student here at the Wilson School, but previously worked at the New York City Office of Management and Budget. Um, I want to ask about the stimulus funding cliff and if this is a problem for local governments that are relying on stimulus funds to do sustainability work. So what, what are the plans for how to finance, continue to finance sustainability projects once the stimulus goes away? <laughs> um, 
I think this is again, do you want to start, Fred? Why don't you, uh, from, your, from the small government perspective, and then we'll try and wrap up with giving everybody a chance to respond. Well, quite frankly, the, 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 the rules uh, uh, for getting it are, 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 not, are not terribly friendly. Uh, at the level of, of a municipality at Maplewood, it's 24,000. There were uh, big grants given for, for, for municipalities at the 50,000 or over. Uh, but uh, we're in line uh, for some, but um, it, I, I, can't, I can't speak too, too authoritatively about, about the process. I know it's, it's, a bit, it's been a bit arcane, and we're not able to get the kind of help that we want to. Yeah. So, uh, Andrew? Yeah, I think it's an important point that sustainability efforts have to be sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and one of the three legs, the economic portion of it, is something that's, you know, that's going to be a big problem. And, uh, and, and I mean, remember, Kyoto was turned down by the U.S. Senate 95 to zip because it was looked at as being a major economic problem for the United States that we weren't ready to face. Um, in the future, I think that we're now reallocating resources. You know, I mean, some towns actually have environmental managers now. They, they're taking it out of the budget. A lot of towns don't have that because their priorities are different. But as things evolve, um, we're going to have to work to make things uh, work within the economic system that we have as well. So you know, maybe not, it doesn't answer your question, but, but uh, it, it's important that when we go along, you can't make sustainability uh, a, a lockstep uh, philosophy. You have to co-op people into doing it with you, and you have to be able to pay for it. And I think, as you know, a lot of these examples pointed out before, if you do it right, you can make money doing it. And that's, and that's sort of a, the important message of it. Um, I'll give Rit and Mark uh, a couple of seconds here to respond. Um, well, I think one of the, so your question about the cliff, what happens when the <laughs> stimulus is done, I think is well taken. Um, the stimulus, by definition, has to be a short-term thing to speed up or to replace spending that you weren't able to do but had wanted to do. That's actually mostly what we're thinking about it, uh, the way we're thinking about it in New York, that because our revenues went down, we're using the stimulus essentially to be able to be on track as much as possible. So presumably when revenues return to where they should be um, as the economy recovers, that will naturally get filled in as long as the city continues to prioritize it. You, exactly the same answer. We're trying to be very careful about avoiding the cliff by spending, in some cases accelerating, spending that we'd already planned and budgeted for. So it's exactly, it's the same kind of idea that what this is, is a chance to kind of achieve some of the savings that are the self-financing mechanism a little earlier than we might otherwise have been able to do, but no reckless, unsustainable spending around this stuff. I just want to thank the entire the panel in the room. here for really an exceptional job. Uh, it was fascinating, and a special thank you to Richard Keeby for putting this panel together and this day together. Thank you.